Coming up, two aspiring Cherokee ballerinas take the trip of a lifetime to train alongside Russian ballet masters in New York City. All my life, I never thought I'd go very far from Oklahoma. So to come here to New York is amazing. It's so cool and I'm, I've had so much fun. And teaching Cherokee history and culture at Diligua, the Cherokee Nation's living museum. It gives a people exposure and it teaches people that Cherokees are real. We're still here. We're not a, a gone or lost people. And renowned Cherokee artists Bill and Demas Glass tell us what inspires them to take risks and move Cherokee art forward. There's not many people really uh, combining ceramics and steel. I feel like that's an evolution that's pretty interesting. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing. Succeeding. And steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. OCO and welcome to the Cherokee Nation. We're so proud to share our stories with you. Wado. OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. Today we take you to New York City to witness a once-in-a-lifetime experience for two young Cherokee ballerinas. They were invited to train in an elite three-week-long summer intensive, learning from ballerinas from the highly acclaimed Vaganova Russian School of Classical Ballet. The girls say the trip was a priceless reward for all of the hard work they've put into their art form. A ballerina is supposed to look like she's elegant. She moves very gracefully. A ballerina just looks beautiful. She pulls her audience in and never lets them go. Share everything with them. A ballerina should be able to move easily and effortlessly and not make it look like it's painful. It means that we can show our emotions, we can show the beauty, we can show the, the sadness, we can show the anger, we can show everything just through our movements. We don't have to talk to a person, we can just show them by arms or the way we turn or anything such as that. So anytime I'm feeling like I'm at a hard place in my life, I can just go to dance and let out everything and it helps me through everything. We are here for a three week summer ballet intensive for the Vaganova School in Russia, and it's called Open World Dance Foundation. We're just taking classes from people who have come from Russia in ballet, character. Uh, we've done a little bit of point, just all kinds of classes to get us ready for our future. It's a really big opportunity, and you can only do this once in a lifetime. It's just a really good experience, and you can say, oh, I was taught by the Russians. <laughs> Bum, bum. And one, and two, and three, and four, and stay. I graduated from Vaganova Academy of St. Petersburg, Russia. My teachers were last students of Agrippina Vaganova. Um, academy is named after her. I was very, very lucky. I had six students of Vaganova in my life. They were my teachers and coaches. Vaganova was a dancer herself. What Vaganova did, um, while she was raised herself in Chiquetta method, and then she studied French, um, she took the best of both worlds, combined them, and through her own experience as a dancer, came to understand that there are um, some things that, are, that can be left you know, in, out in Italian and in French schools and then combined and brought together 
um, her own, what came to be as a Vaganova method. Any really world company that's anybody world famous, you're gonna go, and it doesn't matter where they dance, but you're gonna go, oh, you are from St. Petersburg or from Moscow. Oh, yes, okay, that makes sense. We had uh, quite a few auditions, and we allowed in only kids who really want to learn. I wanted to make sure that we give an opportunity to those who really would want to learn and who have a lot of questions about this rare art form because we have the answers to those questions. I started at the age of six. Ballet, it's, it was a better way for me to express myself and it's a lot of fun because I've made so many friends and I can always go to dance and be with them. I started when I was six as well and I the reason I started was because I had been diagnosed with Mestinia gravis. We had knew that there was a problem and we went and seen the pediatric neurologist and he came, came to me with a big old stack of books and told me he knew what was wrong with her. He told me in 80% of cases that it would continue to get worse and it would basically it's just their muscles are on, the voluntary muscles are not being able to be controlled. They just quit working. And uh, so I said, what can we do to keep her, you know, to keep these things going? And I said, she's been taking ballet. She wasn't real serious, but um, he said, continue that. That's kind of how we stumbled into ballet. And she's never, she's, I guess what they would say in remission, um, she's never had any more symptoms other than those at the very beginning. So we just try to keep her healthy and keep her going. Since I've been here, I've done a lot of walking. I've met some very interesting people, <laughs> and I've done a lot of amazing things and seen amazing things. All my life, I never thought I'd go very far from Oklahoma. So to come here to New York is amazing. It's so cool, and I've, I've had so much fun. The thing that I most miss about Oklahoma <laughs> is seeing grass and trees. I'm tired of seeing concrete. <laughs> Ballet is my way of breaking free from other people. It's my way of expressing myself. Dance is kind of like my safe haven. It's not just, oh well, look, you do it this way. You, you, you do this with your arms. No, it's you gotta put your arms here, you gotta move your legs here, and you better get this spot right here. It's tough. I, I hope people see that this isn't just something that is easy for us. It's something that takes a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication. And I hope they see that and not something else. I'm, I'm proud of myself for getting this far because this is just an incredible opportunity to be able to come here and dance with these people. It's, I mean, it's amazing to me because I never thought I'd amount to anything like this. I never did. It's surprising for me to even think about coming here and getting this opportunity. I'm, I'm shocked. I'm just very grateful. Nearly 20,000 Cherokee Nation citizens voted in this year's elections, re-electing Principal Chief Bill John Baker to another four-year term. Baker, who is from Tahlequah, got 52.6% of the vote, so no runoff election was needed. We were so blessed and pleased to win re-election without a runoff. It gives us the opportunity for continuity, gives us the opportunity to build on the successes that we've started. Voters also chose to re-elect S. Joe Crittenden as deputy chief with 63 percent of ballots. According to the Cherokee Nation Election Commission, about 62,000 Cherokee citizens are registered to vote. Just under 19,000 ballots were cast in this election. Today, there are more than 500 federally recognized American Indian tribes, each one with its own unique history and culture. For nearly 50 years, the Cherokee Nation has been teaching our history and culture through a living museum, a historic village on the grounds of the Cherokee Heritage Center near Tahlequah, where Cherokees teach the beliefs, history, and culture of our ancestors. 
Diligua is a name that comes from the word Teleco, a principal town in the Cherokee's original homelands in eastern Tennessee. The Cherokee Nation built its first historic village replica in 1967. For someone who's never been to Diligua, it is a representation of a 1710 southeastern village. And the reason that we chose 1710 is because it is the dawn of the trade era. Grandma worked out here. She started as one of the uh, first managers out in the village and most of her children came out here and worked with her in the summers as well. So my dad grew up out here uh, and then of course it ended up being the same thing with me. Once he came out then I started working with him as well. So it really brought a great family dynamic. It's almost something that's in the blood. I came back here in the 60s and the 70s. I was in there. I said me, my mom, my brothers. I said we worked in that village for a long time and uh, I enjoyed it. Learning from someone else the elder of our time was, we were learning off of them. And so we carried it on to our children. In 2013, the old village was replaced with Diligua, which is based off of archeological evidence from our original villages. What we're trying to do is pass this on to future generations, finding people who are interested in it. And that's what we've created Diligua for to bring everything back into life. Now we're trying to, to get with sight, sound, touch, smell, trying to involve all the senses when they come here and see this village. The visitors who come here come from all over the world. We have school children, we have people who come uh, out of nostalgia. They're bringing their grandkids here after having visited when they were children themselves. We were here 49 years ago and then uh, this has is, this is improved and we haven't been back. And this is a tremendous improvement over what it was over the years. We're from Los Angeles, California. A lot of times we go to these small towns around the United States and we go see their little museums and they all have a lot of cool stuff to see but this one definitely had way more to offer than a lot of those small little museums that we visited while we're traveling through the country. Diligua actually makes a big difference to teaching the Cherokee history and culture. A lot of people who have come through over the years, um, especially on my tours, have repeatedly said that they learned more in the one hour that they spent with us out here than they did in all their years of history classes in school. You know, you learn things out here about Native Americans, Native American culture that you're not going to learn in your regular every day to day life. It gives people exposure and it teaches people that Cherokees are real, we're still here, we're not a, a gone or lost people and I think that it, it gives so many people and even our own Cherokee people, it gives them an opportunity to come through and learn more. It's an opportunity to get to ask questions, usually with people who are very ready and willing and excited to help them out with gaining their more knowledge. Part of the reason why everyone loves Diligua is Cherokee people framed in a very small historical moment. They are framed in almost kind of a box and it's very palatable for a lot of people who don't have any experience with, with Indian people or, or with Cherokee people either. Uh, for little kids, little kids always want to know where the teepees are. Yeah. And I say, well, we didn't have teepees, we lived in houses like this. Well, we still get a lot of people who come through and their idea of an Indian is they have one idea of an Indian. They don't think of Indians as individual groups. They don't think of the Cherokee, they don't think of the Choctaw, and they don't think of the Comanche. We're all the same to them. We absolutely get tourists and guests who come in and are shocked that we don't have headdresses, that we don't have um, what is typically thought of as, as Indian especially people from other countries. It would amaze them. All the stereotypes that they had been taught, they expected to see that when they came out here. And so it was a matter of breaking it down and teaching them that we're each our own individual people and then teaching them more about who it is and what we are to be Cherokee. When you really think about what it means for us to be here in Oklahoma, by having Diligua here, it sort of reinforces the fact that even though we see this as our homeland now, we were, we were forced to come here against our will to great detriment, loss, and destruction to our people. So what do you hope that people, uh, when they leave here, what do, you, what do you hope people take away with them? I hope they leave with a newfound respect. I hope that they leave thinking, I really enjoyed that place.
That place was great. For us to come together as a community, that means learning about where we come from and it means learning about who we are. And if Diligua can give people a little tiny piece of that, then I think that we're doing a good thing. If you'd like to learn more about Diligua and the best time to visit, go to oco.tv and click on links mentioned. A new Macy's Direct-to-Consumer Fulfillment Center is now open in Owasso, Oklahoma, thanks in part to a partnership with the Cherokee Nation. Principal Chief Bill John Baker joined state and local leaders at the dedication of the 1.3 million square foot building. Right now, the facility ships Macy's and Bloomingdale's products to seven states and will eventually service the entire country. You should not take for granted what you have here, Chief Baker. You, you all work together so incredibly collaboratively. I mean, it's really, uh, it's really quite unique. And that doesn't happen in uh, every state and every community. It just doesn't. So you should feel very, very good about that. They, you know, anytime we can do a partnership where our resources go 10 times further than if we just did it ourselves, I mean, it's a great investment uh, for, for the Cherokee Nation to partner in things like this to create those jobs and to uh, raise the economy of northeastern Oklahoma. The Cherokee Nation worked with the state of Oklahoma and the city of Owasso to locate the center in northeastern Oklahoma. The tribe provided half a million dollars in incentives and employee recruitment support to help lure the retail giant into the Cherokee Nation. Jalagi iniwoni hi. Let's talk Cherokee. First phrase in English. What is the weather like? Gado usti, gosti, doidi. What is the weather like? Gado usti, gosti, doidi. Is it going to rain? The gahnanis. Is it going to rain? The gahnanis. Eight Cherokee families are now homeowners and are all moved into their new homes thanks to the Housing Authority of the Cherokee Nation's new home construction program. The eight homes on the southwest edge of Nowata were built on vacant property the county owned but donated to the Cherokee Nation. The tribe decided to use the land for its housing program started by Principal Chief Bill John Baker in 2012. Chris Nicholson's family is growing and he says this home could not have come at a better time. Having a four bedroom house as opposed to a three bedroom part apartment is is much, much better. Everybody's got a place to play, everybody's got their own room, and now we have a yard and a backyard. Since the announcement of the program in 2012, the Cherokee Nation has built 200 new homes and has another 220 under construction throughout the tribe's 14-county jurisdiction. For more information on the new home construction program, go to oco.tv and click on links mentioned. It was June 23, 1865. Brigadier General and Cherokee citizen Stan Wadey signed a ceasefire agreement from his post in Dokesville in the Choctaw Nation. With his signature, Wadey became the last Confederate general to surrender from the field at the end of the American Civil War. 150 years later, archivists at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, stumbled upon the handwritten ceasefire hidden away in a folder inside a box labeled Indian Correspondence. I'd looked through that folder a little, but never really got deep into it, and there was a page in it that looked different. It was fancier paper, and it had a ribbon at the top, and so I just pulled it out because it wasn't kind of, it just didn't look like the other materials that were in there. When I flipped it over, there were a lot of signatures on the back page, including Wadey's and a couple others. On the left of the document was the date June 23rd, 1865. I was super excited. My eyes filled up with tears. I was like, I, this is, this is it. I think this is it. You're looking at a treaty that ended the Civil War. Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union forces on March 29, 1865, but historians say the Civil War officially ended for the Cherokee Nation when Wadey signed this treaty and his unit of Confederate, Cherokee, Osage, Creek, and Seminole Indians disbanded. After the collapse of the Confederacy, uh, Wadey held out some longer, and it wasn't until two months after Lee surrendered 
that Wadey uh, came to terms with the federal government and negotiated the treaty that Blaine found. Before his surrender, General Wadey was part of several Civil War battles and raids, including one that sunk the J.R. Williams Riverboat that was bringing supplies to Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. After the war, Wadey represented the Cherokee Nation as a delegate to Washington, D.C. He died in 1871. The newest Cherokee Nation Casino is open for business in Roland, Oklahoma, and tribal officials say the casino is already bringing hundreds of new career opportunities to that region. The $80 million development is creating hundreds of new jobs with its expansion. Tribal leaders say that growth will improve the quality of life in the Roland area, not just for Cherokees, but for everyone. When you do something like that, I mean, those people, they work here, they live here, and they, you know, they spend their money in the area, so uh, it should be a real boost uh, to the economy. The 170,000 square foot casino and hotel offers 850 electronic games, table games, and a private high limit poker room, plus dining and a cocktail bar. The resort style hotel featuring 120 rooms is slated to open this fall. The Cherokee Casino and Hotel Roland is located off Highway 64 on Cherokee Boulevard in Roland. They're a father-son duo bringing Cherokee art to a whole new, unexplored level. Bill and Demas Glass are already renowned artists, and with each new public art installation they create, they hope to influence even more people, speaking to them on a level they say everyone can understand. The clay has a spirit, and I'm helping that spirit come out. Me and the clay have to work together, the clay lady. That's how I approach it. My name is Bill Glass, and I'm a Cherokee contemporary ceramist. A ceramist is anybody that works with clay. I'm a contemporary ceramist because I use various equipment, a potter's wheel, electric kilns, but I still combine that with the traditional techniques also. I just use any technique that I can figure out, maybe sometimes invent, to try to achieve my vision. I was born in Tahlequah, went to school at Central State, and I made the commitment to be an artist, and I went out to Santa Fe and studied there for two years at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And that's when I really pushed myself to learn more about the Southeastern style of artwork. And that's our prehistory. It relates to all of us. My son, Demas, uh, he's an artist in his own right, too. I think one thing, you know, about being kind of the old guy that people hear about me and sometimes don't give him enough credit. When he was young, I took him to all the art shows. He uh, studied art, fine art, and came back and I made him a deal. If he wanted to share a studio, we'd expand the studio and uh, we'd both become partners. If I'm gonna have a studio, I might as well be close to the place where I work because then I can get up and go over there. And the way I saw my dad working as I was growing up, he always lived right there close to the shop so he could get out there and get to work. I always had various art projects going on. My dad would have me making stuff or, I, you know, there was a lot of times I would be hanging out in the studio and building art pieces. And... Now this was, uh, this is an early art piece. It's, it's, it made it throughout the years, so that's, that's good. That's something I always try to create is longevity in what I do. Also, he, he taught me a lot of things that were interesting, mixed media type things. It wasn't just ceramics. Sometimes it was rigging up my car, you know, fixing, you know, doing some rigging on some stuff. So, I mean, that kind of taught me different applications. I really enjoy the industrial application of producing Southeast designs. To me, that's getting to be a real contemporary form of how I can get the Southeast designs out there in a contemporary version. My pieces were limited to the size of my kiln. With Demas involved, he 
can build armatures out of metal and I can do my pieces and attach it to the metal so my scale has gone up to as big as his. Whatever he can do, we can accent each other. There's not many people really uh, combining ceramics and steel. I feel like that's a evolution that's pretty interesting. I think that art can speak to people without, you know, just by through your your mind and uh, visualizing, you can understand somebody just without a spoken word. You can just, art can do that, relate to you in that way. That's what I feel like. Public art is one of my main focuses in my career. I, I enjoy the challenge and I enjoy putting art out there for people to see, you know, and, and contemporary art is uh, something that I really feel uh, is interesting to me just because it's it's uh, the evolution of art. What we're finding out is that the more we do these different kind of projects we're even more experimental. It's pushing us as artists too. We're using plastics, powder coated metal, stainless steel, and ceramics. I mean we're, we're, we're broadening our own scope of what we can do. Public art is important because it's out there and because of the usually the scale of it, you know, you get to pass by it and you might be in a bad mood or things might not be going where well. You get a chance to look over there and see something that maybe change your mood for the day, maybe give you a better insight for the day. And even if you just view it for a second, we need more of it is what I say on public art. We need more of it here in Oklahoma. We have a big story to tell with our art and it just it gives us a chance to, you know, to do something new and it challenges the artist and challenges the community even to be involved and uh, it's just, it becomes public, it belongs to everybody. I had some people from Switzerland track me down and come by and, and I, to pick up a piece and I had it a towel over it and when they came in and I pull that towel off and they start crying that you know that's good <laughs> makes you really happy next time on OCO voices of the Cherokee people raising gourds as art we sow seeds with Cherokee gourd artist Verna Bates and watch how she creates cultural masterpieces from nature we hope you enjoyed our show, and remember you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at OCO.TV. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. So until next time, wado. If you'd like to visit the Cherokee Nation or for more information on Cherokee Nation attractions, go to visitcherokeenation.com.